Good morning, and thank you for joining Manager Tax's webinar. Today with us, we have Marco Lima, Private Wealth Advisor and Managing Director of Morris Retirement Advisors, and Allison Kogan, CPA Tax Professional from Morris Retirement Advisors. At this time, I shall turn it over to Marco. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Lima, a CFP here, a Private Wealth Advisor, Manager Director of Morris Retirement Advisors. A pleasure being with you today. Uh, with me, we have Allison Kogan, who is our in-house CPA and, and tax professional. I'll say hello, Allison. Hello. I will be <laughs> chiming in later. Um, uh, we have a very, you know, timely and interesting topic to discuss today, which is managing your taxes. Um, before we get into that, I'd love to uh, share with you a little bit about kind of uh, the body, our body of work, and also share some disclosures. Perhaps I'll start with the disclosures. Um, please note that this is all the information that we're going to discuss today should not be construed as tax advice. Uh, we certainly recommend that you take a lot of good notes. There's a lot of information to be shared, and uh, we'll be hosting a Q&A session at the end. But above and beyond that, uh, any discussion or should be implemented here with the help of a tax professional in or obviously if you need if you feel that you need support or additional questions and would like to uh, discuss tax advice with us would be more than help to entertain with that but that's to be offline please do not implement any of the trend, the material that we're going to discuss today uh, just a quick background about Morris retirement advisors we are a, a private wealth practice of uh, Ameriprise financial located here in Parsippany, New Jersey, with offices in um, Sparta, New Jersey, as well as uh, New York and, uh, and North Carolina. Uh, our primary focus is really uh, simplify the financial lives of uh, individuals and, and, and small businesses uh, from a financial standpoint through a very unique and proprietary process. We look at little things before they become big ones um, and develop a, a, a plan of action that surrounded around and tell around a client's needs and goals. We basically look at taxes, which is the topic today. Uh, we have the ability to provide tax advice and tax preparation, uh, financial planning, investment management are very uh, strong in that area, as well as insurance and the workplace financial wellness. So in a full gamut of financial needs. Uh, our website is morrisretirementadvisors.com if you're interested in learning about us. But with, without further ado, let's talk about taxes. So, um, very interesting, you know, if you look at the ever-growing and, and, and changing environment of taxes, uh, what we've got, we've got to understand that the only constant thing is change. And uh, on the verge of a new election, um, not here to be political or anything of that nature, but it's natural to expect that we will have and should have way overdue tax changes um, coming up. So I'm speaking from the situation that we are in today and, and moving on from there. Um, what's imp important to, to, to determine too, there's two types of uh, tax um, conditions, if you will, or scenarios that we look at. We look at tax preparation and, and tax planning. Tax preparation is simply, you know, the exercise of collecting all the um, forms that you get on around February or March uh, and turn it over to an accountant. And then doing your taxes on that end, that's one way to do it. That's looking your taxes from a what we call a, a rear view mirror. Uh, we are, it's, it's important to do that. You should do that, obviously. But it's also equally important these days to do tax planning, which is looking through your tax situation through the front, of the, through the windshield. Meaning, what's coming ahead? How will my uh, income be taxed going forward? How will my investments be taxed going today and going forward? And we we spend a lot of time uh, on that on that exercise and creating unique and, and customized solutions for clients to address those things, um, you know, based on their, their situation. So I think it's, there's a lot of opportunities, especially throughout the year, and we'll discuss some of them today. Uh, what's important here, um, setting expectations for the content here, because it's such a broad audience, so we will be discussing some things that are considered to be basic from a tax standpoint, but we want to form 
a, a baseline for which you can get more specific. Um, but if you indulge uh, us here today, um, well, the goal is to provide you some, some sound bites that will enable you to uh, take action, if you will, on personally or with the help of a professional, uh, especially before uh, the year end, because some things could be definitely done before um, December 31st. So, um, so kind of here we go. Um, just uh, it's kind of mind-boggling just to think about all the taxes that we pay, from income taxes um, to property to school taxes to um, liquor taxes. Uh, if you live in New Jersey and you want to get out of the state, you pay taxes to get out of the state, right? So those are interesting taxes. And then in New York itself, a lot of our audience, New York City, there's some interesting taxes there. I'm just kind of laying the ground on how complex things are. Uh, at the risk of being basic or, or to make sure we sound, um, we, we talk about the different taps, types of taxes that are out there. I'm going to turn it over to Allison Kogan. She will talk about the different um, ways that you can obtain tax relief, and then I'll pass it on to her. Right, so Marco just went over the types of taxes we pay, and then there's obviously some things that we can do to get relief from those taxes, and there are several methods to reduce the amount of tax that are owed by taxpayers. And there's just a few categories up here that we can just take a quick look at, and one is tax reductions, that where the tax can be reduced either temporarily or all the way eliminated. An example of that is the law that permits taxpayers who have reached age 70 and a half to make qualified charitable distributions from their IRA directly to charities. It was tax-free, subject to certain limitations, which of course is always, just about everything is subject to certain limitations. But that reduction has been extended repeatedly over the years until the end of 2014. And changes such as those make annual tax planning especially important and challenging because as of this time that hasn't been renewed for 2015, but it doesn't mean that the government won't change that either in this month or next month to reenact that specific reduction, which is why you should be continually talking to your tax advisors, tax advisor to see what has been renewed and what has not been renewed. There are also tax deductions and exemptions which are used to reduce your gross income, which can be either above the line um, and that would affect adjusted gross income, and itemized or standardized standard deductions. And in a lower income may be helpful. All of these above the lines reduce your income, and lowering the total amount of income would reduce the amount on which taxes are owed and it would also lower the marginal tax rate that applies to the income amount. Uh, we will explain marginal rate later on. But there's also non-refundable non tax credits, and these are the ones that are you know, more appealing than just deductions. After you figure out how much income tax you owe, you can subtract the tax credits from that amount. A tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in the amount of tax you owe, so that's why that makes that one much more effective. It does obviously vary depending on your tax bracket. However, if you qualify for a $300 tax credit, you may be able to subtract the entire $300 from the amount you owe the IRS. There are two categories of tax credits, refundable and non-refundable, which are exactly what they sound like. The refundable means you can actually receive a refund check if it exceeds the amount of tax you owe. And obviously, you know, that is one of the things you have to work closely with your tax advisor to make sure that you use every tax break that is available in your situation. The deductible expenses, I mentioned before, standardized or itemized deductions. There is a general standard expense deduction for those taxpayers who do not incur a great deal of deductible expenses. They're entitled to the standard, which for 2015, is $12,600 for married taxpayers filing jointly, or $6,300 for single taxpayers or married filing separately. The itemized deductions are for people who 
um, have qualifying expenses that exceed the standard deduction. And then you obviously want to consider itemizing because you want to use whichever one gives you the better tax benefit. Uh, if you have their itemized deductions can be phased out if you're in the higher tax bracket over 309,900 for married taxpayers filing jointly. The reduction in itemized deductions um, doesn't doesn't apply to all the itemized deduction, but it really does reduce it quite a lot. There's also deductions for state and local sales taxes or income taxes. That's one of the options that you have to discuss based on what state you're in, whether it would make more sense to deduct the state income tax or your state sales tax. So that, again, is something you have to discuss with your tax preparer. Great. Uh, we just got a question here, and it's probably more for Allison. Um, uh, how many uh, W-2 allowances should one person claim? That depends entirely on your family size and your deductions. The lower the W-4 exemptions you claim, the more taxes they deduct. Right? Yeah. So. That's something that you know you want to talk about with your tax preparer and decide based on your specific situation. They do give you some examples on that form that you can read, and you know will help you fill it out. But and you can always change that during the year if you decide that something has changed and you want more or less taxes taken out. Um, that's a that's a very good point, and and there's generally a debate between planners and and tax advisors about uh, this very issue, where you know one. In one side, and quite frankly, not the case here, but sometimes accountants are market themselves as being able to uh, give their clients the most, the biggest, and the fattest tax return possible. And most people love that because they believe that this is what we call for savings. Uh, whereas a planners, and 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 our belief here is that you should do enough work to minimize the amount of refund and, and quite frankly, uh, possible payment that you would have getting as close as possible to zero for what purpose? Let's say if you were to get a uh, $12,000 refund, which is sometimes common, uh, technically meant that you lent the government 12 grand and you waited close to 14, 15 months to get that money back. Uh, from a planning standpoint, that's a, a negative savings approach uh, where you're getting nothing from it, you lend the government the money, and we would prefer if, if things are done in conjunction with a tax advisor uh, side by side like we do, to have a, you know the $1,000 extra in your pocket every month so, so as to reapply that towards your goals and earn interest right up front starting January as opposed to April, who knows, May of the following year. So that's a very big one in terms of tax advice in there. Um, we did get another question. That's okay to answer those questions as we move along. We thought of we doing this at the end, but that's okay now. Uh, the question is, if I live in another state for a portion of the year, how much of my income is taxable by my current state? It depends on what state you are in some and I'm sorry for tax for for taxpayers age 65 or older I don't know if that matters it doesn't matter it, it depends on what state you're in most states will tax all of your income but then give you a credit for the taxes you paid to your previous state so you'll have to file in both states and calculate the taxes based on you know where you were at the time and your home state at the end of the year will likely tax everything and then give you a credit for what you paid to the other state. So if you're moving to a, a tax, a state with different tax rates, it could be either beneficial or, you know, you could get stuck paying the higher tax rate because they won't give you a credit for more than they would have taxed it at. Wow. Okay. That's, so it sounds like it's an individual case-by-case -case basis. Always and again, and if... Uh, these we do these we do these types of presentations all the time for the audience. Um, you know, just uh, uh, we are always open to give folks second opinion on their current uh, overall financial plan and, and work tax situation. Uh, you saw our website. Um, you can also there are information on phone numbers and things like that and emails that you can reach us out later on. 
But moving, uh, moving along, speaking a little bit about the Social Security, uh, just as a reminder, the Social Security base wage increases to uh, increase to 118,500 from 117 uh, in 2014. So all this to say that wages above that are not subject to uh, Social Security taxes, but they are subject still subject to Medicare. So if you're an employee, 6.2 percent of your cover wages go to a taxable wage base. Um, and then a portion that goes to um, the Social Security component of, component of FICA. Uh, and if you're self-employed, you typically <coughs> excuse me, pay 12.4% of Social Security. Uh, also, this came as a result of Obamacare. Um, there is a uh, 0.9 additional Medicare taxes uh, in addition to the Medicare portion of FICA that applies to a uh, individual uh, age earners, uh, married farm jet is 200000 and for single is what, 150 I believe it's 150 I think it's 200 for anyone. That's 200000 so you just pay. Um, and that's, so again, you can have, guys can ask any questions you may have at, at any time. Um, I apologize on the last one. Uh, so it's, it's um, 250 for married couples, and then the 200 for single earners. Um, just going to skip the slide here. The only thing that I wanted to actually before doing that, uh, also that came out of the, um, the Patient Protection Act and Affordable Care Act of 2010 is this new concept of net investment income tax. Uh, kindly know the NIT internally here. So what is that all about? Um, if you are subject to the NIT, uh, which are basically for individuals, for married uh, taxpayers of $250,000 in income and single payers of $200,000 in taxable income, any investments outside of a retirement account, so a brokerage account uh, that you may have, um, Generally, they're subject to capital gains, which we'll talk about it uh, down the road uh, within this presentation. But if you fall within those categories, you're subject to an additional 3.8% uh, taxes um, related to the net investment income tax. Why is that important? Because suddenly um, you are moved away. You know, instead of paying really 15% uh, capital gains or 20% if you are in a 39 point, you know, the higher tax bracket, you now jumped up a lot of 4%. And quite frankly, when we speak of investment strategy, is the diversification, and we'll talk more about that. Should not be about the investment themselves. It should be for tax itself. So things that there are. <clears throat> so what goes into that? Rental income portfolio income, all could be subject to, to the NIT. The only exemption, exemption that we know of right now is tax-free munis. So should you have all your portfolio in tax-free munis to avoid the NIT? Probably not. But at the same time, it should be evaluated carefully against all the other taxable or tax-deferred accounts that you have to determine really how much taxes you, you can have. Preface by saying that you should not make investment decisions based on taxes um, alone, but certainly you need to consider them um, moving forward as the tax bracket comes in there. Another question came in, um, at, at what wage should we begin retirement planning and how can we utilize my income funds to begin to benefit me? Boy, um, that is, believe me or not, um, we're a private wealth um, um, firm here, but we do work with uh, in young folks, the, genera the X's and Y's, Generations X's and Y, and, 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 and sometimes why is that? I wish that this concept of financial planning was actually taught in school, and quite frankly, I would be totally okay with choosing a different career because our entire economy could benefit from, uh, nation could benefit from the concepts that we, we help educate and help clients implement here. It's never, it's never, it's, I could say never too late, but it's never too early. You know, uh, a lot of things, if you're thinking about planning for your retirement, just let me frame it. Most people want to have the option of stop working uh, on around the age of 65. 
use that as a reference point. There's so many challenges around retirement. The main one, the primary one today is longevity. So which is kind of a silly way to look at things, but we when, unless the client requests is otherwise, we make financial plans to last, for, you know, meaning creating a retirement income stream, a paycheck, if you will, to the age of 100. So right there is 35 years and from which, from where money needs to come from somewhere. And then if you think about 35 years of income, that's a big number. And thinking about what's available, uh, what benefits are available to, to us today, Social Security being the main one, uh, which accounts for much less of a retirement income than they used to be 10, 15 years ago, and in the future, we're going to even count even less. So it is contingent upon each of and every one of us to save for retirement, and quite frankly, I go as far as to say it's almost it's a responsibility. Because if you don't save for retirement, you're going to be relying on the government for a lot of things. And if you rely on the government for a lot of things, everyone pays. So i um, very passionate about retirement planning and, um, but he, you know, and setting up specific goals and things of that nature. So, um, and the, the second part of the question is how can I utilize my tax refunds to benefit me? Again, start by not pushing for not have a refund, but you know, it, 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 you need to have the discipline, however, you know, going back to that $12,000 uh, refund that I just spoke of, um, ideally that means you could have had $1,000, it's not apples to apples, but indulge me in this, in this discussion, $1,000 more uh, a month to, to save implies that you need to have the discipline to save. And that's the difficult part. Um, and then it's not until you have a formal plan of action to really kind of, let's just be quite candid, take that away, that money from you and put it somewhere for your future, um, diversify from an investment standpoint and also a tax standpoint that you really can do it. Um, the other question that came in is how can we know if you are financially ready to retire? Um, we go, we cover at, at least six risks in retirement. It's a fully full exercise. Um, you, you need to know at the basic level what are your committed expenses are, what are your lifestyle expenses. You need to be able to inflate that, um, you know, over time. Uh, that's one one part of it. Um, the question really is, does that do I have enough? Where is the money going to come from? See, folks, um, I, I'm not, don't really, do not collect the age of the folks that are participating in this, but just as a, as a framework, if you paint a picture of getting ready for retirement as climbing a, a mountain, generally speaking, climbing, you know, and then retirement income is descending a mountain. When, and then if you make an analogy, I'm not sure if anyone in the uh, audience is, is a climber, but you would, if you do your research, you will know that most accidents don't happen on the way up of climbing. You, you, you could afford a market downturn. Sometimes people become nonchalant about it. I don't care. We'll come back. Well, once you get to the peak, it's great. It's a great feeling. But um, now you have to descend the mountain. And from mountain climbing, climbing you, you will find out that most accidents happen right at the tip when you start descending. It's because you have accumulated whatever you accumulated, and now you have to make an income stream out of that. So um, I'm going to get more specific and about you know, pre-retirement ideas and where to put money to save in a little bit. But descending the mountain is, is the, 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 the ongoing effort because, quite frankly, uh, when we create a plan, and if you were to create a plan together, it should not be static. You do it and then you move along. It has to be a living body because it needs to be flexible to the current uh, market conditions. It needs to be flexible to predict the changes in Washington and things of that nature. So, however, the target is still the same. And sometimes, quite frankly, professionally, I get the challenge from clients. Why am I reviewing my plan if nothing changes in my life? And that's, I guess, is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, 
But however, you got to realize what's going on around you. Uh, markets, uh, volatile as they are, um, all kinds of issues financially, uh, economically, uh, political going on that affects uh, changes in taxes, changes in benefits, and so on and so forth. So it's an ongoing effort, okay, as we kind of go on. i uh, love to pass it on to Allison to talk about some additional uh, tax reliefs that you are available for families now. Right, and the, the key to these is just knowing that they exist, and if they would apply to you, then to know that you either talk to your tax professional or if you prepare your own tax return to know to look for these, to take advantage of them. Some of them were made permanent until the government decides to change them, they should be there forever. And then some of them were just modified until 2017, which of course will be here before we can believe it. The one, one of them that was made permanent was the marriage penalty relief, <coughs> and that just expanded the 15% tax bracket for married individuals filing jointly. Another one that was made permanent is the adoption tax credit, and that's the exclusion amount for employer paid adoption assistance and an increased adoption tax credit. The maximum credit allowable is 13,400 in 2015, but of course phase outs do apply. Um, the credit is completely phased out for taxpayers with AGI more than 241,000, and married taxpayers must file jointly to get this credit. Certain changes in the child tax credit have been made permanent, including the increase in the credit amount to $1,000, and child and dependent care credit was also made permanent. The maximum expenses qualifying for dependent care credit were raised from 2,400 to 3,000 and the income-based credit percentage was raised from 30% to 35%. So again, these are the ones you just want to know exist so that you can make sure they are on your, included on your tax return. The following credits were extended through 2017. There's a child tax credit um, refundability that for lower income parents to claim refundable credits. There is an earned income tax credit Parts of the earned income tax credit were made permanent, and certain increases are extended through 2017. There's also the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which provides a credit up to $2,500 on the cost of tuition, fees, books, and course materials with higher income phase-outs. So after 2017, this credit will revert to the HOPE Scholarship Credit, again, unless Congress you know, changes their mind again. The bottom line is that Taxes obviously must be paid. So if you have to pay them, we suggest that you do all you can to control when you pay them and how much you pay. And that's the what is coming up next. Well, just by, by hearing you talk about all these deductions and phase outs, I'm like, man, I'm glad that you do this and I don't. Let's <laughs> 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 you know, see it out. So, um, you know, I can't, can't imagine, you know. Um, question came in before we go along. A how much money can I draw for my personal retirement portfolio and for how long? Ah, good question. Um, well, the worst answer, uh, it depends. Um, there's two things, uh, but I can give you a general rule of thumb, and please don't implement that without really taking a look at the entire picture. But if um, one of the challenges or the tests that we, we want to look when we have a portfolio is it's something uh, about what we call rates of withdrawal. A lot of discussion in, um, in, our, in, in, in our industry about what is a, a sustainable rate of withdrawal for a portfolio. Um, most people would say that if you go beyond 4% um, year, yearly, you're actually going to run out of money uh, very soon. So a lot of, without getting too specific with the math and whatnot, but generally if you do take over 4% of a portfolio, doesn't matter what the amount is, you, you will run out of money within 14.6 years, which basically let's round it up to 15. So while well, my account did 10%, can I take 10% out? No. <laughs> uh, it's, you stay within that, that boundary. So there are different 
uh, strategies or vehicles that you can put in place that actually enable you to take a higher portion over 4% out of there. Um, just, just another, Ameriprise is the largest financial um, planning institution in the country. We have tons of data that supports kind of this advice. Uh, this office here, it's, it's been blessed to be one of the top in the country. We generate, um, you know, just me alone have done over a thousand plus financial plans in my 13 years or so here. Um, even in good markets, if you generally, if you go above 5%, uh, there's going to be an issue. Um, so, another question came in. So just indulge me here because it's a big question. You may not have budgeted when you were working since your job provided a steady stream of income. During retirement though, not only does your income change, but also your expenses depending on your lifestyle, traveling, pursuing hobbies, and miles increase. How can we plan accordingly to ensure we have a good retirement plan? Again, um, it, it's a combination of things. Um, I can share with you a little, a little bit about the, the process here. Um, we're, we're, as we create, uh, uh, let's just call it buckets for you from which you're going to draw an income, you need to consider um, some buckets that provide um, guaranteed sources of income. Generally, that's good because you will have guarantee expenses in retirement. Those are the, the uh, essential expenses. And you're, you know, if you're planning, a lot of a lot of a big mistake that we see that clients make, or individuals that come to us right up front, first time, is I'm retiring next year and putting all my money into cash. That's generally a, 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 a not a good idea, uh, despite uh, current market conditions. Reason being is that. Retirement is not a, an event that just kind of ends when you stop working. It lasts, as I was, I was giving an example, on average 35 years or so. So money needs to be working. Quite frankly, you're going to a portion of your portfolio should be aggressive because it's 35 years of income that needs to come, come in there. But starting with the end in mind, um, you need to have a budget and you need to stick to it. I have planning conversations. January is our goal, what we call goal tracking season where we track to make sure the, plan, the first plans that we put in place are actually still validated, um, you know, uh, despite all the all the bells and whistles, if you will, we'll put on these plans, nothing's guaranteed in life. We cannot guarantee, you know, returns or things of that nature. So we're putting, testing every plan. But are we having conversations with clients about what, what their income is going to look like or what their income needs are going to look like two years from now. What trips? Uh, what uh, are they going to contribute to their grandkids' education? Are they going to have to buy a new car? We're trying to be two years out and, quite frankly, have cash available or guarantee sources of income available to cover uh, expenses for at least two years. Why is that? Well, if you look at market history, this is if you average it out, it takes about two years for a recovery to come, come around. Granted, the last one market recovery took about five or six years, depending on who you ask. But this puts us in a very strong position where you're not selling investments at a loss to cover your trip to the Bahamas, if you will. So, but it's our individual, and again, uh, we would certainly entertain having uh, complimentary discussions with everyone on the panel to um, to see whether or not we can help them uh, or at least give them some tips uh, we'll give you some information on that so now let's talk about things you can do uh, both pre-retirement and also in retirement uh, what you should be seeing in front of you now is a triangle uh, we would call it a tax control triangle it's just basically uh, I'm a visual person so Love to see really the picking for you. Um, just simplifying how Uncle Sam taxes you. It's very interesting, and please don't get mad by the explanation. This is not a Ameriprise thing, it's just the IRS for you at work. So, before tax or after tax in, what is that? So, before tax here, you put the money into a particular vehicle, 
such as a 401k plan, a traditional IRA, if it is deductible. You get tax deferred on the growth and it's taxable out. Uh, the vast majority of, of Americans, you know, first of all, people are under saving for retirement and those who are saving have most of their money into a 401k plan that was pre-tax, uh, which basically means you are at the mercy of the IRS when you retire to pay taxes on that money. One of the biggest, you know, and what would the tax be? I have no clue. <laughs> no one, no one does it because, and if they do, they'll be lying to you because we're talking about ten. You know, it's tough to predict what the tax rates are going to be next year. Um, not, not last for 35 years worth of income. So we need to empower clients to have a diversification from a tax standpoint. So let me kind of explain. If all of your money is on a pre-tax bucket, you have a million dollars coming out, and then how much, it, the misconception, especially if you're living in the Northeast, that when you retire, you are going to be in a lower tax bracket. Well, um, whether you stay in the Northeast or, or go somewhere else, it, it goes back to what is your lifestyle and what are your expenses. So if you are spending you know, if your essentials and discretionary expenses are about, I'm going to keep it simple, $100,000 a year, guess what? You are on a 25% tax bracket. And if you were made $100,000 a year throughout your life, guess what? Your tax rate doesn't change at the current scenario. This is real, guys. Uh, very few of our clients actually, um, people that come in, sometimes, uh, just kind of give you a little reference point in terms of industry. Uh, people tend to work with brokers and investment managers, which is all great. These are all great professionals. They need to, they help them kind of get to retirement. We are retirement income specialists, meaning we have we help folks both in the pre-retirement and in the retirement phase meaning everything that we do is to prepare you for one day, give you back your income in the most taxable, efficient way. Uh, if you're not having these conversations with, the, and brokers will not have a conversation with you about these things, maybe they do, but they can't from a legal standpoint get too deep into it because they don't have the licenses nor the expertise to, to do that. Uh, reason being, they're primarily focused on your investment. So uh, as you look and talk to and choose your investment professionals, which we always encourage you to do, Really understand what you actually, what services you're actually getting. Um, if you work, if you're doing your own investments, you're actually doing financial planning, but you're looking at it from one lens, the investment lens only. Uh, investment decisions should be made based on taxes, should be based on in state planning, should be considered your insurance, should consider even your cash flow. Make sure you're putting everything where you need to put it. But I just talking about taxable out. So what do we do? Uh, in pre-retirement, sometimes retirement, you can do some of this. You have to have diversification. Someone needs to go in the after-tax bucket in, taxable while you have it, taxable while. What's that? A regular brokerage account, um, which subject to capital gains and possibly the NIT, which I spoke of uh, not so long ago. What most people don't have, and that's something that we work on building, is basically a tax-free out bucket, after-tax in, tax-free growth, and taxable out. Um, what are those things? Things like Roth IRAs, sometimes munis, um, and sometimes cash value ins insurance, if they make sense. Um, let's take that a similar, uh, the $100,000 income that I just spoke. Should we have done over on a pre-retirement and sometimes retirement, have built and put money in these different, bucket, different buckets? taxable, tax-free, tax-deferred, and we go back again and look at that same $100,000. And if you were able to withdraw basically close to $25,000 from a tax-free bucket out of that 100, and a little bit from the taxable, we no longer are in a 25% tax bracket. We're in a 15% tax bracket. So guess what? You just save 10%. It has nothing to do with investments. It has nothing to do with the rate of returns. You know, it has to do where the money is. So this is extremely important 
extremely overlooked and um, we spend great time on it in pre and post retirement. Okay. Um, so this is going forward is just basically kind of a little bit more explanation of what, what we're speaking of. You know, bank accounts, your CDs, your savings, they're all taxable out. Savings accounts are on average paying half a percent and it's taxed out of your ordinary income. So it could be paying 30 percent, 25 percent on half a point. So that's kind of the environment that we're in. I turn over to Allison to talk to us a little bit about the marginal tax system that we have in. This is fun. Oh, lots of fun. <laughs> so basically, we we're just talking about you know the before tax and after tax, and and getting to your taxable income is where this comes into. So basically, your wages and anything you earn, and in the investments that create income, all roll up into being your taxable income. And obviously, while not technically an investment, you know that's the income that is taxable. And the some of the tax cuts have been extended for everybody but those people at the top, meaning the high income earners. In 2015, the top means 464,850 for married couples filing jointly, and 413,200 for single. The top rate, as described on your chart, there is increased. Um, to 39.6 percent. And marginal tax rate, these are actual tax rates, but the marginal tax rate is what you really should be concerned with. And only the income that falls in the, that given range is taxed at that rate. So for example, people who are married and filing jointly, so the right side of the chart, only the income they pay only 10% of the first 18,450 of their taxable income. And again, taxable income is the gross income less your adjustments, less your deductions, and less the exemptions that we talked about earlier. So a married couple filing jointly, if they have taxable income of 75,000, they would be taxed at 25%, well, only the last $100, not every dollar. And exact goes, that holds true all the way up to the top bracket. So if a married couple filing jointly has taxable income of $464,950, only that last $100 will be taxed at the highest rate of 39.6%. Um, because investment income is added on top of your wages and other earnings, your investments are generally considered to be taxed at your marginal rate. And we'll discuss taxation of capital gains in a moment. So, and of course, that this chart above does not apply to all taxpayers. In certain circumstances, a taxpayer may be subject to the alternative minimum tax, or AMT, which just about everybody has heard of. And it's the dreaded AMT that's discussed. And I think that is the next slide that you're seeing now. And the government did permanently increase it for inflation. In the past, it's been always the same amount, which, you know, obviously people's income has been increasing over the years, and they never increased the AMT, so more and more people were subject to it, and they just started increasing it for inflation. So theoretically, some people will start falling out of the AMT, but it's definitely something you still need to know about. And if you're subject to the AMT, it basically means that certain deductions and exemptions and credits are eliminated to determine the taxpayer's actual taxable income. The exemption amount is then subtracted from this AMT income, and it, it's obviously phased out again above certain income amounts. So even for the highest taxpayers, there are, they will be subject to the AMT. So for example, Significant amounts of long-term capital gains can reduce, can reduce or eliminate the amount of other income a taxpayer can exempt. And the ability to deduct interest on home equity loans that weren't used to purchase or build your primary residence is not available when calculating the AMT. There are certain things that you know, are going to be taken out of your reductions to pop up your income again. 
So if you're subject to the A&T, you must effectively pay the greater of regular A&T or the A&T. So that's why it's the dreaded A&T, because you're going to have to pay the higher of those two amounts, the tax at the regular marginal rate or your A&T. So given the A&T treatment of deductions and losses and credits and the flat tax rate, the A&T can produce a higher tax bill than the regular tax system. So it didn't get any better even though we explained it. Wow. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Allison. Uh, what question came in here, I heard that there was three phases of retirement income management. Can you talk about that? That concept is, um, it's, it's been thrown around and, and it basically look at, I guess, life stages and whereas uh, a lot of folks would spend more in the first 10 to 15 years of retirement, the, the expenditures will be sort of leveling off uh, the next, you know, ten, five to 10 years or so and then kind of goes away and in, in as they, you know, uh, finish their retirement years, if you will. Um, that's one way to, to look at things. Uh, we're, even though we're, we're planning for 35 years and, and creating systems in place to create for, for 35 years, one of the things that we look at it is for the, basically this, what we call the certainty of uncertainty. What can we create above and beyond investment management to protect for things such as healthcare expenses, which are tremendous, uh, things such as extended care uh, needs in retirement, which basically uh, we look look at those things as being what we call a retirement insurance because if somebody in your family, it doesn't have to be you, when we look at this, the question on extended care, a point on extended care, people get very turned off by the concept of extended care insurance or aka long-term care insurance. I'll say this, if you were to contemplate this, you would know and have looked at it, you know it is expensive and will continue to be expensive. But if you do this, you don't get, look at those coverages for yourself. You get for the people uh, on your, your loved ones will have permanent uh, and irreversible impact on your life. So you, you, because something has happened to you, somebody has to step up, someone life needs to be interrupted. That's the emotional part of it and the financial part of it. Um, you know, inflation projected, somebody in their 60s today, uh, if they were enter long-term care in the 80s, it's looking at, you know, if nothing changes, it doesn't look like it will, looking at eight hundred dollars to $900,000 in expenditures. It just wipes out everybody. But going back to the three phases of retirement piece, um, we prefer to look at this master plan, if you will, 35 years out but make it flexible to address your life changes. Uh, and every year, that's why we review, we'll go track it every year because changes will happen in your life and in your situation. So um, it's on a high level, a long-term life plan, if you will, but it's important to that is being revisited and, and we looked at it on a yearly basis. So therefore, we don't look at three phases of retirement income, we address the needs um, in, on a, on a short-term basis, meaning two to three years out, as much as we can anticipate them. And for the things we can not anticipate, um, we create, make sure there were uh, systems in place that would step in in the event uh, an unforeseeable thing happened, whether it's uh, a life situation, an uh, unexpected uh, disease, or somebody passes away, or on the flip side of that, you're now all of a sudden a grandparent and you want to help um, your your grandkids' education, or some of of us who are uh, sometimes some clients, I call them boomerang kids. Oh, excuse me, sandwich, the sandwich generation where they're helping. They're saving for retirement and they're helping their parents with. Uh, with extended care issues and they have two kids back home from college, which is, they never go away uh, in a good sense because they're paying for their, their college and things of that nature. So there's things to be addressed. Those are what we call one-offs that you really don't anticipate. But moving on and talking about capital gains, um, 
Interesting enough, um, if you remember a few moments ago, we talked about the, the, the different, the, what we call the tax control triangle. Uh, capital gains are related primarily and only to uh, the bottom left of the triangle, if you remember, is just basically brokerage accounts um, and things of that nature. So what you have there is, you know, most people sometimes don't know, if you're in a 15% tax bracket or 10, your capital gains is zero. So what can we do to bring you to the 15% tax bracket? It's not done through tax preparation and retirement. It's done through tax planning. And anything above and beyond the um, between 25 and 35 percent, you subject to the 15 percent. And and <coughs> we're back. Uh, this is came back in um, not so long ago. to uh, state, as state with any taxes, um, and then the, the, the exclusion there is way lower than the federal exclusion. In New Jersey, I believe that's around 675000 So what does that mean? You passed away and you're, you have a home worth about half a million you had about another half a million in life insurance and you had maybe three hundred thousand dollars in investment account that's about one point three million dollars anything over six seventy five could be subject to death taxes in New Jersey don't don't get mad by it some people don't know that <laughs> um, but we can we're gonna can speak more about that um, as we go along um, another thing is about the annual gift exclusion for donees. Uh, this is probably um, one of the most overlooked kind of a rule in, in, in a book, meaning, you know, technically you're supposed to only give per person uh, a certain amount per year. Sometimes it changes. Uh, this year is $14,000. If you were to give more than that, uh, it's okay but you do need to include what's called a gift tax um, form. Do you know what that form by hand is? I know. That's a gift tax form in your tax return, uh, which basically means that if you, let's say you give 20,000, 6,000 above 14,000 should be part of your overall tax return for a state 
uh, for excuse me, gift, uh, gift um, purposes, which means that you have used uh, your a portion of your lifetime gift gift exemption. So let's see how does that get all reconciled? The IRS with them, uh, nothing happens until it happens in the sense that um, you got to look at things like you know these things and what you file and don't file, what you're supposed to report and report, like, um, you know, the analogy that I make is it's like speeding. You can speed all your life and then you get caught, but eventually you could get stopped. So why speed? So that's really the story there. Um, what else? Um, charitable deductions are going to have, Allison, would you mind enlightening us a little bit on that? No, I seem to get all the things that reduce the taxes, so that's fine <laughs> that's with me. That's good for you. You'll be the good one here. There are some tax advantages if you itemize your deductions. We originally talked about standard deductions versus itemized, and this is charitable deductions help if you itemize your deductions. And there's a variety of assets you can donate and potentially deduct. Um, you can obviously donate cash. You have to have written proof, whether that's a check, a canceled check or a bank statement, something in writing from the charity in order to deduct that contribution. Contributions of $250 or more require additional documentation. Most charities now realize that they have to give you some form of written confirmation, so that shouldn't be a big deal. Non-cash property, you can donate. You can donate stock. Um, you can donate cars. Again, you have to have, you know, um, support paperwork to show that, and then there's other forms that you'll have to fill out on your tax return. And they do have benefits for outright donations of stock held long term for you and the charity. You get a better deduction if you donate appreciated stock, whereas if you sold the stock, it would be, um, could be a capital gain tax that Marco talked about earlier. So that's definitely something you can discuss and whether it would benefit you to donate the chair, chair donate the stock to charity or sell the stock. Okay. Thank you, Allison. And then um, let's talk about tax tax really uh, tax free investments, which are, are kind of my favorite. So just give me a second here. Um, these are just the example. <coughs> these are not investments at the top of Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks, by the way, just by definition. Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks are not investments. They are accounts. What goes in them are the investments. Some people get confused by that. Um, municipal bonds, I spoke earlier, have tax-free features, cash value, life insurance, college savings plans, uh, and tax exempt mutual uh, mutual funds. Um, the basically sources of tax-free incomes are very very compelling, especially uh, if you are looking to create and manage your taxes today and managing your taxes in retirement. What I, I refer to these um, instruments before kindly as buckets, and um, I look at them as buckets because they need to get they need to get filled over time so you can actually disperse from them, but they don't get filled overnight. Um, and then the work that you do in pre-retirement and sometimes retirement is, is going to give you a benefit for down the road. So it requires some planning and effort there to really reap some of these benefits, if you will. Um, I want to focus on Roth IRAs because that's <coughs> definitely a tax-free idea. Um, some of you may have, so after tax dollars goes in, tax-free withdrawals. Um, you know, there's income limitations on who can contribute and how much. And then there's no limits on conversions, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit. So um, who can contribute? Basically, if uh, the numbers are over there before you, uh, if you are a single filer, uh, you, you make over 131000 you not can cannot contribute. Um, and if, only if you really make below 116, there's some what they call phase outs in between 116 and 131. But for this year, it's 5,500. If you're under 50, 6,500, what they kindly call catch up contributions. So making your full contribution to a Roth IRA, if you qualify, of $6,500. Uh, Mary finally jointly is about sort of almost the same in terms of if you really have the numbers. 
but uh, you <clears throat> need to be making less than 183 to kind of be now subject to a phase out for Roth contributions. Conversions is something that we often speak about. So what <clears throat> what does that mean? And actually, before going to conversions, some work and employer sponsored plans have an offer um, Roth. 401k features, which means there's no income limitations. Anyone can contribute. You just don't get a tax deduction today, but it comes out tax-free. Conversion means you take money from a before-tax account, a traditional IRA, and you you put it into a Roth IRA. Why would you want to do that? Um, because if you do that, you pay the taxes. And anyone can do that, provided they have a traditional IRA. You pay the taxes today. The concept of Paying the taxes now versus later need to be looked at carefully, and each person's case is different. But uh, I'll leave you with this. Um, do you prefer to pay your taxes on a seed, or do you prefer to pay your taxes on a harvest? That's really the story. Meaning, if you put money into the traditional, the traditional IRA or 401k, you're making a, a choice to say, for the $100 that I put it in, if it becomes a thousand, I'm going to pay taxes on that a thousand. But today, I got a tax break for a hundred dollars. If you are choosing to pay the tax on a seed, you're not getting a, you're putting the same a hundred dollars, but you're not getting a tax deduction there. But if that is same a hundred dollars becomes a thousand, is all tax free. There needs to be a balance between the two buckets, if you will, and again, between a financial planner and a tax advisor, we can come up with the optimal, optimal amount for each of the buckets, for, for each and every one of you, for our clients. But let me bring this home for you. Uh, tax rules are complex, as we know. They change often. Um, it's so many taxes you've got to pay over, life, over your lifetime. Uh, in various tax brackets, it could change, and we need to know that. And then really the idea here and the concept is to help you create or have tools to uh, take control of when and how much you pay. And creating tax diversification is really key. Uh, sometimes equally as important as investment diversification. And you should consider aligning your investments with taxes. Not to say make decisions, investment decisions primarily in taxes is really paying a closer attention than before. Um, you know, and don't do it alone, I think. You know, as you can see, this, these things are complex. Uh, we are here for you. Um, and um, I'm going to put our contact information. Always you can go to um, uh, morrisretirementadvisors.com. Uh, you can really connect and get more information about each of the advisors and, and our team members there. Uh, we can call us directly or, or even email. Um, and I really want to thank you for your time today. Again, um, and we're going to leave you my phone number, 973-928-8752. Allison? Oh, Allison's number is 973-265-1182. And um, thank you for your time today. Hopefully you found this uh, conversation helpful. And I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Allison? No, that was it. Thank you very much for your time. I believe that any other questions that were up there, we may be able to get to offline. Yes, we'll get those offline, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you again, and happy holidays, everyone.